Hi, Chang. Hi, Anand. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So it's great to have you here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So thanks for having me here. Yeah. So today my guest is Chang Hyung Kwan. He's an associate professor in industrial and systems engineering at KAIST in South Korea. His research aims to advance computational optimization methods for efficient transportation and logistics systems. His current focus is to improve the efficiency of heuristic and exact algorithms using machine learning approaches to solve large-scale vehicle routing problems and mobility service operations problems. His research has been published in Operations Research, Transportation Science, Transportation Research Part B, Informed Journal Computing, and so on. Currently, he's on the editorial boards of TRB, Socioeconomic Planning Sciences, and the Transportation Network Modeling Committee of TRB. He was the chair of the Urban Transportation SIG of the Inform Steel Cell Society and is the current international liaison for Asia Oceania. He wrote the book Julia Programming for Operations Research and he is a member of the Jump Steering Committee. He received the NSF Career Award in 2014 and his research has been funded by the National Science Foundation the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the National Research Foundation of Korea. Chang, once again, thank you so much uh, for accepting the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So, uh, where are you from in South Korea? So, um, I was born in Daegu. Uh, that is uh, like a four hours uh, south from Seoul. And uh, I was born there. Okay, uh, so you were born in 1979, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about your family background. So my father was a science, high school science teacher. And uh, I mean, uh, he was an educator, a teacher, and a principal, and then a school district uh, officer, and so on. And then he when he retired, he was a principal of some high school in, in Korea, near Daegu. And my mom uh, used to be a bank officer, and uh, he wor she worked in the for a bank. But uh, that time, when ladies get married, they usually give up their jobs and then they focus on raising children. So uh, my 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 mother uh, had been a housewife. Right. But, and yes. do you have any brothers or sisters? Oh, I do have a, a younger sister. Uh, she is in uh, working. Uh, she's working for some company. Uh, also lives in Daegu, and oh, her job is near Daegu. Okay. Uh, so one of my earliest memories of South Korea is the Olympic Games in Seoul in 1988. Uh, what are your memories from that event? Yes, uh, that Olympic Games actually uh, changed my thinking and my view uh, onto the world, actually. So uh, I was 10 years old, I think, yeah, 10, nine years old uh, at that time. And uh, before that, before that has happened, when I think about like a foreign countries, I was only be able to think about Japan, China, and then United States. So Japan and China are now our neighbors, so we know about them. But the uh, foreign country, I mean, the real foreign countries or only the United States. But after the Olympic Games, I realized that there are like uh, 200 con different countries uh, in, uh, in the world. And uh, that changed my view. Uh -huh. And South Korea did pretty well in that Olympic Games, right? They did. Uh, they did. Of course, I mean, as a host country, uh, they had some uh, freedom to choose their uh, like a sports, uh, I mean, the competitions they like to do. So uh, they like uh, uh, put some more games for the sports that they did well, like a taekwondo and archery and like a wrestlings and so on. So they got some uh, some some good number of gold medals and then other medals too. Yeah, and and how was life in Daegu and in South Korea in general during the 80s and 90s? So at uh, that time, Korea was a developing country. So uh, growing really fast, and then lots of changes in economies, and then the social uh, systems, and so on. So uh, 
I was lucky. I was lucky. So because uh, the democracy system was also developing uh, very well. Of course, I mean, there are like a lot of uh, tears and bloods, but uh, uh, I mean, it has been improving. It has been improving that time. So uh, I was happy. I was happy with my life. And then uh, I was only focusing on things that I wanted to do. So without oh. worrying about too much about like economies and then the uh, politics. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Traveling was a bit restrictive, though, at that time, right? That's right. That's right. So the uh, traveling, I mean, inside of the Korea, like a domestic travel was not a problem. But uh, to travel outside of the country, they needed some permission from the government for some reason. I don't know. But uh, I think also that is because of the Olympic Games. Olympic Games changed the, uh, that procedure little bit and relaxed it. Now, I mean, we have a uh, total freedom to travel, but that time, I mean, I, as I said, the democracy was developing. So some restrictions on people's life. Mm -hmm. And how did you use to spend time during your teenage years? As a teenage kid, uh, I was a boring person. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a much I mean, interesting things to do. I mean, I went to school, came home, and on the way, uh, some time to time, I visited the arcade and playing some uh, the uh, games there with my friends, like uh, Street Fighters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some uh, some other games around there too. Uh, and did you practice any sports or uh, enjoy reading uh, books or comic books? Yes, uh, sports-wise, when I was in high school, I started playing basketball. And uh, my love of basketball started that time. But the first uh, experience with basketball was actually the, uh, playing the NBA games, the PC games, PC games for the NBA. And then there was uh, like a Karim Abdul Jabba and then Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan, of course, and Larry Bird and uh, all those uh, like uh, famous players. So I admired them from the games. And then <laughs> I started playing basketball and tried to improve my skills that time. And also, um, I read Japanese manga uh, when I was in middle school. I mean, I read a lot of them, a lot of them, like uh, Slam Dunk and Dragon Ball. And what else? Yes, those two were the uh, most famous and most popular ones that time. Wow, my wife loves them both. Uh, and mm -hmm. we even have some uh copies of the slam dunk manga here uh, ourselves That's of course nice. she reason uh -huh. she actually made me watch the entire anime <laughs> wow okay so how I mean, did you like it yeah actually yes yeah i remember sakuragi and the other guys uh -huh. and uh, it was actually yes. fun to, to to watch yeah. and so my interesting thing is the uh so because we read in korean korean translated version of it and then uh i mean korea uh, it's not very good with in relationship wise not very good with uh, japan because of the uh, past history of the colonization and, and so on so so when i was a middle school student the uh, japanese manga i mean japanese culture overall was prohibited in korea like we were not able to import officially like japanese manga to korea and we were not able to watch japanese movies and so there were of course, there were some needs, so uh, there were lots, lots of black markets, like uh, some illegal copies of unlicensed version of the mangas and so on. So I read them, and then uh, because they pretended it's not from Japan, so the, all the characters' name in manga were in Korean names. So I don't recognize still. I don't recognize the uh, the name that you mentioned, Sakuragi. Yeah, Sakuragi so, is I the mean, main yes. character. Yeah. Main character of Slam, Slam Dunk, right? yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I know that guy's name is uh, with the red hat, right? Red yes, hair. exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So uh, his name is known as Kang Bae Ko. It's a co completely Korean name <laughs> in my reading. So <laughs> So they translated yes. the names uh, in, in yes, Korean. Yes, okay. yes, Okay. Even school's name too. School's name was also translated Korean and then all the hint for Japan has been removed from the uh, manga. Right. But yeah. now, now, uh, now, I mean, they uh, made it official. So they have some licensed, fully licensed and official translated version of those mangas. Yeah. I'm not that much into mangas and, and animes, but uh, my very favorite is Senseiya. 
that was mm -hmm. very popular in Brazil in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even my mom I, I love loves them it. Too. You see, yeah. so she bought the mangas herself. You can you oh, imagine? Wow. I mean, she was already uh -huh. in in her 50s uh, to her 60s. You know, because it, it took time for them to complete the entire saga in in mm -hmm. the anime, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the manga was there, but they kept on postponing right. until. And then, the the good mm -hmm. thing is that uh, she was also very interested, so uh, mm -hmm. we could you know watch together. And of course, my wife also liked it, but she's she I think mm -hmm. she likes it more. I mean, other mangas or and other animes uh, like Dragon mm -hmm. Ball, for example. She finds right. it more, yeah. But anyway, and, and how was the music scene in Korea in the 80s and 90s? And what's your take on the K-pop phenomena? Oh, wow. Um, so, I, uh, like many other teenagers, I started listening to music in my, like, uh, when I was uh, 13, 14. And that time, the K-pop industry was beginning, I believe. Like, uh, uh, we had some, like, uh, famous singers uh, in the past but not has been really industrialized at the time but uh so when i like a 90s like a mid 90s something was changing there but but i mean many of my friends were listening to like uh Sateji and boys Tej and boy Tej boys they say and then uh some other uh famous like a dance singers and like a boy boy bands and girl band, girl groups and so on but I, I wanted to I wanted to be uh, something different, somehow different from them. So I went to the uh, record shops and then uh, asked the owner for recommendation. He recommended me uh, the Beatles, the Beatles from the uh, UK, and uh, I started listening to them and I liked them. So I actually was listening mostly uh, to the Beatles during my teenager life. Wow, my, my introduction yeah. to music was also through the Beatles because of my brother. And I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan. And and what do you think of the new song? The new song, yes. Uh, I didn't really have uh, much time to devote in, uh, but uh, I mean, I like it. I mean, basically the idea is like uh, having like, reviving the old recordings of John Lennon and then uh, making uh, like a modern. And um, it was good. It was good. It was good. But uh, I liked the uh, the previous two songs, like uh, Real Love and then A Phrase of Bird More. But uh, I will keep listening. I will keep listening to the new song, and uh, I I hope mm -hmm. my opinion will change. Right. I, I like the yes. three of them, and I must mm -hmm. admit I was very surprised with this uh, new song. I I was familiar with the uh, John Lennon's original demo, uh, mm -hmm. which was poorly recorded and so on. I was not expecting that much, but they did a hell of a job there. You know, adding orchestration and mm -hmm. uh, reusing takes from George Harrison, and you know, playing the guitar, and then uh, I, I liked it very much. And the, the video clip yes. is also really oh, emotional, wow. and uh, yes. yeah, you know, it's it's yes. it was very good to to have that nostalgia and uh, having the experience of listening to a new Beatles record is 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 very nice. Always, yes, always, it's nice. But yeah. uh, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, I lost a little bit of interest in the Beatles because I'm these these days I'm listening to the K-pops, <laughs> K-pops really? mostly. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. I mean, I have a, a teenager daughter, and then she's a big fan of the K-pop, and then uh, that made me that made gives me a more motivation to listen to the K-pop so that I can communicate with her. And uh, my uh, mostly I my conversation with my daughter is about K-pops. And then here's a new song on the K-pop, and what do you think? And then is there any songs that you you recommend me? And, and so on and so on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, K-pop bands are really popular in Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, even some of my own students like it. So <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So uh, around that time, uh, there was a boom in electronics in South Korea. I mean, the eighties, nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the reason behind this, and how did that affect the country in general? Yes, uh, I mean we know the company very well, the Samsung, Samsung yes, Electronics, yeah. and then uh, yes, uh, it's a global company. It's very has been very successful, and then they started their business as a, like I think agricultural business mostly, like uh, importing some uh, crops and then uh, exporting some crops and so on. And then they started a new business which was uh, uh, Samsung Electronics. And then they focused on started uh, to devoting into uh, the semiconductor business. So before that, Samsung, I mean, the Korea didn't have anything about the semiconductors. 
but uh, they started the business and then uh, they tried to learn from uh, some other uh, the industry leaders, especially from Japanese companies like Toshiba and Panasonic and so on. And uh, they finally they caught up. So in 90s, uh, Samsung Electronics was expanding their business and has been really successful and earning lots of money. And then all, so the most popular engineering job was electric engineers. And also that influenced me too. So, I mean, I didn't have a specific goal in my life that time, but vaguely, vaguely, because I liked math and science. So I wanted to be an engineer. I, I was hoping that uh, when I grew up and uh, I could be like, uh, hired by Samsung Electronics or scouted by Samsung Electronics. So that was my somehow gore. Ah. Yes, that yeah. never happened, but <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and how was your high school experience? So uh, I went to uh, science high school. It's uh, some specialized high school system in Korea that accepts some uh, selected students from middle school and then admit to high school and then it's all dormitory based so i lived in dormitory uh during my high school years and uh, surrounded by uh kids like me like uh, who love science and uh math and they are quite nerdy so i was able to uh enjoy my conversation with them actually i liked my uh, high school years uh -huh. And but you know, it's uh, we are all lived in dormitory. There are some uh, fun events, like fun incidents. Uh -huh. Like uh, yes, uh, we didn't really quite sleep well during the night because we are busy with uh, playing with other children. I mean, playing with friends and uh, having some uh, long conversation over the night. And I played basketball a lot of times in high school and overall. Uh -huh. I was happy. I was a happy kid at that time. Yeah. So you left your parents' house uh, at that time, right? To, to That's go to right. High school. Yes. Uh, although we lived in the same city still, mm -hmm. still in the same city. But uh, usually during the weekends, uh, we went home and came back like a Sunday night, Sunday evening to the dormitory and lived in the dormitory for during the weekdays. Mm -hmm. And uh, what made you pick the mechanical engineering degree? Yes, uh, that's a really interesting story. I mean, uh, I didn't really have a passion for a mechanical engineer. So uh, I, when I was asked to choose a major when I was a sophomore at college, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I didn't really have a specific major in mind. And uh, I first eliminated any, any major related to chemistry because I was not good at chemistry. I didn't really enjoy chemistry. So chemistry, like a chemistry, uh, biology, chemical engineering, all three were removed at first. And then I was looking at like uh, some math oriented programs because I, I mean, the only thing I knew about that time was uh, I like math. So uh, I first considered mathematics as my major, but that time out of like a 600 people in my grade and only like five of them chose mathematics as their major. And they were all from like a mathematics Olympias and, and so on. So I was scared. I was scared. <laughs> I don't know. And then at uh, that time, there was some misbelief among people that a uh, mathematics major cannot make money. They cannot, uh, <laughs> I mean, feed their family and so on. They so, couldn't uh, be more wrong, was, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It's a uh, it's completely different story right now. But at that time, people were afraid of it. So, you know, it's, uh, the most people, most successful people were like electric engineers at that time. So uh, mathematicians had some bad, uh, I mean, so there, that is a misbelief, I think. But I was scared. I was scared. And then I considered industrial engineering because I vaguely remember now uh, because I liked math, but also at the same time, I liked, uh, how do I say, non-engineering components of life. Like I was, I liked uh, like uh, sociology and other more into like arts social science. and yes. social science. Yeah, social, social science. Mm -hmm. social, I like social science as well. So I chose industrial engineering. And when I asked my parents about their opinion, and my father also had no idea what that is. So he asked to his friend who was an engineer at some company. And the feedback from his friend was negative because 
you know, industrial engineering is some method that, I mean, to make things better, like, uh, right? But uh, Korea at that time was developing, so uh, making things better was not that important. Make things happen was more important. As a result, you know, in the uh, in any company, industrial engineers were not well treated. I would say, they were not very well treated. So because of that, my father's friend was negative about it. So I was impacted, and that time I was not passionate about industrial engineering as well. So I went on my friends again. What is a good ma- good uh, mass oriented program in at KAIST? Uh-huh. So they recommended mechanical engineering because um, in mechanical engineering, lots of like uh, dynamics and statics and fluid mechanics and so on. There are lots of uh, calculus used there. I loved calculus. So that's how I ended up with the mechanical engineering. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I decided to do industrial engineering, uh, mm-hmm. my dad was not really excited about it. And, and he, was, <laughs> he was saying, what are you going to produce? But my mom was more supportive. And, and mm-hmm. anyway, I finally mm-hmm. did it. But I can understand yeah. <laughs> the skepticism. Yeah. At times, right, it's right. still not very clear uh, to mm-hmm. some people what is the degree yes. and what is the career of an industrial yes. engineer. You understand that. Yeah. And, and were you exposed to OR in college? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, of course, I knew about OR because uh, my roommate uh, took a course in OR. And although he was not an uh, IE major either, uh, he took a course in like an intro to OR, something like that. So I learned a little bit about OR because of him. Mm-hmm. But I had no exposure to OR at all. And, and what about coding? Coding, of course, I, I loved coding. So um, first year at college, I was taught in like a C programming and computer systems in general and some of the Unix systems. And then uh, when I took like a uh, numerical methods for mechanical engineers course, uh, I mean, I learned some like computations and coding too. And uh, from those courses, I learned some coding and uh, I taught myself some coding too. So I did some small project with uh, one of the uh, I guess really two laboratories in at KAIST Mechanical Engineering with uh, web programming. So web programming was a rising area at that time, like a late 90s. And uh, I was interested in them. And then uh, I used Perl language to build some, some small search system for, for those two laboratories. Mm-hmm. You started to earn some money by also building some websites, right? Correct, correct. So that's how I, I made money. So I mean, it's more like a, like a uh, undergraduate internship at the research labs, but uh, the uh, professors gave me some specific job about building websites. So I earned some money using right. those jobs. And what did you do after graduating? So initially, I was admitted to a master's program at Mechanic Engineer. And after one semester, I quit. I quit the uh, graduate program, and uh, that time was uh, like the dot com bubble, like 2000s and 2001 and so on. And uh, I wanted to join them. I mean, I didn't have a courage or any idea or resource to start my own business, but I wanted to join them. And then uh, I finally joined them, and then uh, it was for like a building websites. So. My company at that time was like building lots of websites for different countries. I mean, com- companies, I'm sorry. And then uh, one of the uh, websites I built was from Samsung Electronics. And uh, it was like anycore.com. I mean, I didn't build the entire thing, but uh, anycore.com, some part of it, some part of it. So, yes, that was my first contact with Samsung. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you finally ended up having some connection with them. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. so, right. And, and why did you decide to do a PhD in the U.S.? Uh, but you first had to quit uh, that job, right? Right, yes. Uh, during the job, I was excited in the first year. I mean, everything was new to me because I went to only the schools. And uh, that was my first job. And I'm re- I lived in the real world. And I loved the feeling of it. And then uh, I went, I mean, I was watching my own uh, like craft is actually in action. So it was a great feeling, and uh, for the first year, it was awesome. It has been fantastic. But in the second year, the same thing repeated. In the third year, uh, the second, same thing repeated again. So I was tired, and I was bored, and I lost my interest. 
and uh, instead I wanted to study more. But that time um, I was surrounded by uh, many, some of the uh, IE people, and then they introduced me about the world of the IE, like a supply chain management and financial engineering and the human factors and then like psychological uh, aspects of the engineering and so on. And then I became interested in um, how people people uh, interact with each other in a certain group, like companies and other organizations. So let's say organization behavior, something like that. So I decided to pursue uh, my interest in IE major in graduate school, and, but that time was about human factors. I was interested in human factors. And, and then you had to look for uh, PhD programs and mm -hmm. uh, you decided to go to the US that's right. So uh, that was also my initial planning as well. <laughs> so after three years in, uh, uh, in the industry, in the company, my friends, including my girlfriend at that time, were also planning to go to the United States for their study. So I was thinking, I mean, why not me? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how it happened. Okay. And how was your English before going to the US? No, it was terrible. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> but I was not afraid of English. I just thought that uh, maybe if I lived in the uh, United States for a couple of years, my English will improve and uh, I will have no problem. But interestingly, uh, when I was in college in Korea, my uh, university, KAIST, started to teach some classes, some selected classes in English. I was one of those classes. I had no clue what the professors say. And uh, he says something, I was able to understand like one sentence or another, but I never get the context. But, but uh, we had textbook, we had textbook uh, written in English all the way. So I was able to read, I was uh, not able to listen or speak, but I was able to read, fortunately. So I managed to survive. So that experience actually gave me some confidence going abroad, and then maybe I can study well, you know, although even even though I couldn't understand what the professors say it first in the mm -hmm. in the United States, but I was able to read, so that's fine. Yeah, that's very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, did you send applications to multiple universities or just uh, I, Penn State? I, I did send my applications about ten, I believe, and then uh, I was admitted to Penn State. I think only the Penn State. Yes. And how did you end up there? Well. Um, of course, I mean, that was uh, my only admission, but uh, at the time, uh, my girlfriend was also, I mean, she's now my wife, and uh, my girlfriend also uh, sent some applications here and there, and we knew, we knew uh, that the chance that we got admitted to the same school was very thin, so we didn't share uh, our list of applications. And, uh, but later, we found out that we applied to the only Penn State in common, and then we got admitted to the Penn State only. Both okay. So we, uh, yes, both went to the same school. Yes. That's nice. Uh, she's from a different area, I assume? Yes, uh, very different, uh -huh, very okay. different thing. Uh, she's an artist. She's, uh, I mean, her major was a fine art, like uh, drawing and paintings. So very different from mine. Yeah. Um, did you get any scholarship? Yes, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky. Uh, I mean, at that time, Korean government had some program to send some, like, some students to, uh, especially like a science and engineering students to abroad for their uh, education. I was I mean, selected by that program. Mm -hmm. um, and what was your first impression of the U.S. and did you have any trouble settling down? Well, um, so I went to Penn State. Penn State is in the middle of the, uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, which is very rural area, so except like cornfields and then <laughs> some uh, cows, farms, and nothing else. So only the university there. So that was my first impression. Um, oh, by the way, um, that was my first flight abroad and uh, my first international travel. And that was my, uh, the US was the first country that I visited except Korea. So I struggled a little bit because of my lack of English skills. But uh, luckily, I had a, a, one of my friends, um, a year older than me, uh, went to the same high school, went to the same college. He was at Penn State a year ahead of me. So he helped me a lot. 
So uh, with that, I have no problem. Uh -huh. um, is it true uh, that you apply to a graduate school in industrial engineering, thinking of human factors and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So I thought about human factors at first. So uh, I started taking some classes in the first semester. And interestingly, at that time, in, the, in, the, in my first semester, there were not many human factors classes opening at the graduate level. So I just I took like a course in LP, linear program, and that captured my interest. So <laughs> I uh, remembered my, my uh, passion about mathematics, mathematical science in general. So I love in, uh, what linear programming does, especially, especially about the duality. Duality was a really interesting topic for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had uh, different plans, but uh, after taking that class, uh, you ended up following a different path than the one that you thought in first place. That's right. That's right. So my plan changed. My plan <laughs> completely changed. And uh, I mean, I started my study at Penn State in 2003, and that year, my advisor, my former advisor, uh, Professor Terry Fritz, he also moved from other universities to Penn State that year. So he was looking for some student, and I was looking for an advisor in OR. So I approached him and then asked him to be my advisor, and then he agreed. So okay. I went on. Yeah. OR, so, so one thing led to the other, and you you mm -hmm. ended up collaborating, right? Yes, um, and what was the focus of your PhD research? So during my PhD research, uh, I was uh, focusing on the uh, congestion and uh, traffic equilibriums and then how to resolve them using uh, toll pricing, uh, especially in uh, dynamic setting, not as a static setting, dynamic setting. I had some uh, differentiate, differentiation as a governing uh, system modeling language. And then uh, I had some optimal control theory going on over there. and But in general, and overall, I was interested in uh, how to uh, reduce the congestion level using toll pricing. And uh, with that, also, I was interested in other type of pricing, like a service pricing in dynamic competition uh, aspect of the service providers and uh, how to compute their equilibrium strategy for uh, pricing of their services. Uh -huh. So I know you work on VRPs now and other mm -hmm. problems related to logistics, but uh, you did not do combinatorial optimization uh, during your No, PhD. not at all. Not at all. I was mostly on the com uh, continuous optimization field of it. And uh, I even didn't take a course in integer program that time. I had no interest in there. When we, I mean, when I looked at the uh, VRP that time in 2000, 2005, and uh, the people, People say that it's a problem like MP hard, and then uh, people are struggling to solve like up to 100 nodes problem. And uh, to me at that time, I thought it is super difficult problem. We have no chance in succeeding there. So I had no interest in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, did you have to teach at some point during your PhD? Well, I mean, my job mostly was uh, research. So uh, I was a research assistant for, I mean, for the entire area but i was told that i might need some teaching experience to be a faculty member so i asked my advisor to give me some teaching experience so uh that time he was teaching learning and optimization at the graduate level and then uh he asked me to teach like a lecture and uh, i remember it was about a uh, line search method like a gordon section method and fibonacci search method and those kind of method i think I managed it to the end, not too bad, but I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I was focusing on the teaching and then uh, I put too much uh, force on my back to stand up straight because I was nervous I, I might even fall, right? So I was uh, focusing on too much about standing up. And after the uh, lecture ended, my back hurted like hell. <laughs> so so I, that's my first teaching experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, and how did you react to the reveals of your first journal paper? It was from the uh, EJOR, and uh, I was terrified by the reviews. And uh, it was not rejected. 
we received a major revision. I mean, if I think about it now, it, I mean, it's good. I mean, it's good enough, right? I mean, it was not rejected at the initial review. But that time, it was my first experience with that. So uh, I saw the uh, comments from the reviewers are uh, too harsh. And then uh, that's, we had no chance to get it accepted. But my advisors say that we can handle that. So after like uh, a few weeks of the revision, and uh, we managed to accept it. So, but my first reviewer's comments were scary. Was yeah. scary. I was stressed, I was stressed. I think that can be an issue to a lot of people because if they're too harsh, one may even lose interest in, in the academic career because that process mm -hmm. of being judged, you know, very strongly, periodically, it might be very uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, we as reviewers and other uh, colleagues, uh, they should pay attention when, when they write reports so they don't discourage uh, right. the younger generation when they're, you know, mm -hmm. starting to submit papers. Um, you got married during a PhD, right? I was. Um, I, got, uh, I got married in 2005. We started my, our study in 2003 and we got married in 2005 in the middle of the PhD. And uh, we were young. We were young and then... Uh, Yes. And then after that, uh, my wife, I mean, in my wife's field, uh, the terminal degree is the master's degree. So after that, uh, we stayed one year together, still at Penn State. And then she went to Oklahoma as a Oklahoma State University as a, a visiting faculty, visiting assistant professor to teach there. So we lived, we started our life apart from each other that time. And then after that, uh, she joined uh, University of Colorado a border in 2007, in 2007, as a tenure track faculty. And then I graduated in 2008. And then I joined University of Buffalo as a tenure track faculty uh, in 2008. Mm -hmm. So it's quite far from each other. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have the two body problem. Yeah. Uh, it seems that the last year of your PhD was quite hectic, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, lots of changes, uh, lots of life changes. Uh, in 2008, we had our daughter, daughter born in the 2008. And then, uh, so I was, I mean, I remember I was holding my baby during the night uh, while my wife is sleeping. At the, uh, one, one hand, I had uh, my baby. And then on the right hand, I was writing my dissertation. And then I was sending out like a job applications here and there. And uh, even I remember uh, when I was interviewed at uh, Buffalo, I brought my family. I brought my family <laughs> to the interview. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so lots of changes, and then uh, we had uh, still we had a two body problem. I mean, we are lucky to have like two tenure uh, track faculty positions in different part of these uh, states, but still, I mean, we found a job each other, and then uh, but we still had a two body problem with one daughter. So life was very very hard. But. Uh, did you apply only in the U.S. or in other parts of the world? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was serious about finding a job. I was really worried about it, actually. So, I mean, I have an like, engineering PhD, but uh, my interpretation of my degree was very narrow. So uh, I thought that uh, there should be some, I mean, I thought there is no single company that would be interested in my uh, research like uh, dynamic torque pricing, dynamic service pricing, but uh, doesn't really have a, a much of practical value. It's more of a, like a theoretical values of it. So I only apply to academia. So whenever there is a job related to my uh, research, I applied. So I applied to Europe, I applied to Asia, and then I was interviewed in like uh, Switzerland and then uh, a couple of places in North America. And uh, I was interviewed in Singapore and of course one university in Korea too. So I interviewed globally, <laughs> but uh, I, I found one job in Buffalo. But you traveled to all those places for the yes, job I interview? Did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Lots of mileage that time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so as you said, you graduated in 2008 and you moved to Buffalo just after that. Uh, your wife, was living uh, in Colorado uh, mm -hmm. uh, with your daughter and your second child was born in 2013. Could you briefly explain 
how did you and your wife address the two body problem during those years of course during those years uh, my wife uh, because my wife um, stayed with my daughter our daughter uh, her life was miserable i mean the uh, like uh, the pressure for the 10 years was hard and then uh, the baby was demanding so it was not easy i mean although i visited colorado like uh, once a month and stayed there like a couple of days and then come back and uh it's, it's hard I mean, it's hard it's very hard so even for two people to raise a kid is hard but uh, her life was hard but at the same time my life was hard too psychologically because i was lonely and then i missed my daughter and then uh i was my, missing my wife and uh lots of difficulties too but uh we are a little bit fortunate and university of colorado had an excellent um what is it the uh parental leave policy and uh we took advantage of it and uh my wife and daughter stayed in with me in buffalo for a year and at penn state like uh, for six months and so on so it was good and then uh in 2013 so we plan in 2012 in 2012 my wife asked me to have a second child i mean <laughs> after like four years and five years uh maybe she forgot about how hard it was but uh i was negative at the time because i had some pressure of uh, tenure as well so i if i if we have another child maybe we have no hope i mean we couldn't work and then but anyway i was persuaded by my wife so um we had a second child we had a second child and then that time we were in buffalo for a year together and uh, we raised our child at that time. Yes. Uh -huh. so let's talk about your research activities during your time in buffalo uh mm -hmm. could you comment on your work uh on network design for hazardous transportation yes so um i mean my phd work on like uh, uh, equilibriums and stuff and then when I joined Buffalo, I met Rajan Bara, and uh, he's now my friend and mentor. And his area, research area, was uh, hazardous materials transportation and hazmat transportation. And uh, he approached me to co-advise a student, like a beginning PhD student. So because that time uh, I had not many PhD students on my on my own, so I gladly I mean, agreed to uh, advise, co-advise that student. And that's how my uh, work on hazmat transportation began. And I learned something about uh, Rajambara about hazmat transportation. And I tossed in some ideas of like uh, toll pricing or road pricing in general. So we uh, work on, we started working on like road pricing for hazmat transportation regulation and network design. And uh, our research grew and grew and grew. And uh, we received uh, a couple of NSF funding for that area uh, from NSF and then from the uh, uh, Department of Transportation. And uh, we, so hazmat transportation is about, I mean, my work is about finding the uh, safe route for transporting different kinds of hazmat and then how to calculate that. And then um, I started working on like a risk measures for hazmat transportation. Before that, before my work, uh, hazmat transportation were mostly about talking about like expected risk, but uh, I brought some ideas from financial engineering, like uh, risk averse measures of risk, and uh, about like uh, value at risk or condition of value at risk, or even more advanced like uh, spectral risk measures and, and so on. So using those complicated and ad more advanced measures of risk, so I developed some algorithms to minimize those in the uh, in the network, and of course some network design policies as well. Uh -huh. You worked on bi-level optimization at a time, right? Correct. Yes, that's right. Yes, right. So uh, for hazmat network design problem uh, in barbs uh, and upper level, the government and the lower level, there are uh, like hazmat carriers, the trucking companies and uh, hazmat gov I mean, the government uh, tried to impose some policies, but the uh, the response from the hazmat carriers are not well known. But we are just making some assumption that they will follow the shortest pass or like a, a minimum cost pass along the way. So that's a buy level. In the upper level, there is some uh, up, like a risk measure minimization, and in the buy level, there is a, like a shortest pass problem going on. Uh huh. And you later considered the human behavior in decision making in that context, right? Correct. Yes. 
I mean, there was an interesting, I mean, progress of the research. You know, is I was working on the bilateral problem. And then, as I mentioned, as a government, we do not know how the hazmat carriers will res respond. We are just making assumption. So I, went, I wanted to relax a little bit. And then I was talking, I mean, having some ideas and then uh, talking to my colleagues and so on. And then uh, one colleague that time, uh, Jamie Kang, she mentioned that she saw something related in the, uh, from some conference called bounded rationality. And so when people making some decision, not everyone makes the decision completely optimized. So some people bring some heuristics to the, uh, their decision making. And then uh, I love the idea. And then I was exposed to, uh, say, the, uh, some behavior, behavior of the uh, people in decision making. Oh, I see. So, uh, I mean, I make another connection. So I was interested, initially interested in like human factors and then the uh, organization behavior. And then I was able to make some connections with that. So I love that topic. And then um, I enjoyed the like a human behavior aspect of the, uh, the optimization and decision making really much. Mm -hmm. So you were finally able to combine both of your interests uh, in, in through that research work. Um, exactly. You also made contributions in shared mobility systems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I think it was about 2009 and 10, and the bike sharing system was becoming popular in the uh, many, many cities of the United States. And Border was one of those early cities that adopted bike sharing. So whenever I visit Border and I was playing with my baby and so I saw the uh, bike stations, and then some bike stations were full of bikes, and some bike stations were Lego bikes. And then I realized that there must be some operational issues, and then I, I looked up the literature. There is a, some, indeed, there was a, some issue with like a imbalancing of the entire system. So there needs to be some trucks going around to move the bikes from one area to the other. And then that was a variant of vehicle routing problem. So that was my first experience with the vehicle routing problem at that time. Right. So through so, bike yes. sharing rebalancing systems, you mm -hmm. started working on VRPs. That's right. I mean, okay. not that serious that time, but uh, I mean, my interest in vehicle routing problem a little bit became uh, bigger. I see. Um, you moved to Florida in 2015 and your family was finally reunited. How did that happen? Yes. Um, so in 2015, uh, I was up for tenure case. So, and then, uh, I mean, now I can tell. So uh, I had been in the job market every single year while I was in Buffalo because I was looking for an opportunity for family, uh, family reunion. So. I was in the job market every year, but uh, nothing really uh, was fruitful. But in that year, 2015, maybe I was mature enough, and then my wife, as a professor, was mature enough. So University of South Florida, luckily, offered two jobs for us. So we are happy, and uh, finally, now we started our family, indeed. Uh huh. Um... So, as you mentioned, from that point in time, your interest in routing problems increased, correct? So, in which variants you worked uh, during your time in Florida? Yes, uh, that's another uh, vehicle routing, I mean, the uh, shared mobility system. So, I met a guy in, at Infom's conference working on uh, electric vehicle sharing system. And I was talking to him, and then I realized also there is a, another... Uh, imbalance problem. So we need to rebalance the entire shares mobility system uh, time to time. And uh, for electric vehicle, it's a little more complicated. So we are developing some algorithms for uh, vehicle routing problems of that kind. And then uh, there was a boom in uh, deep learning. And I thought that might be a good uh, opportunity to for us to explore some new algorithms for that. So I went, I visited KAIST because the KAIST IE department had uh, many experts in AI and deep learning. So I learned some techniques and methods from them. And then I started working on like uh, deep learning approaches for solving that vehicle routing problem arising in shared mobility system. 
that is time, I think, right before COVID-19, 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. So you worked on TSP with drones and uh, other problems. Yes, uh, I also worked on that problem too. And uh, TSP drone is an interesting problem. And uh, yes, I worked on that problem with using some heuristics and uh, deep learning method as well. And that was my serious collaboration, my first serious collaboration with uh, people in Korea. Uh, could so. you elaborate more on these learning-based uh, approaches uh, applied to routing problems? Mm -hmm. So for TSP, for, for example, uh, dynamic programming uh, approach can solve some small size of TSP exactly. So we can have uh, some large state space and construct a DP uh, search tree. And uh, I mean, dynamic programming can somehow manage to make an optimal solution for a small problem. For a large problem, we don't have any chance. But if we approximate the uh, DP uh, search procedure using neural network, maybe we can uh, make neural network learn about search space and then narrow down uh, dramatically. So uh, the neural network will construct one solution at a time, like uh, that determines uh, one node and then next node and then next node. If you uh, run the neural network, I mean, execute a neural network multiple times, you will construct a route. That's the, the main idea. And then for TSP withdrawn, we can also apply the similar approach, but uh, some other, uh, like a, there are some better neural network structure that are uh, proper for different kinds of problems. So we are searching for some uh, new structure and then a new training method uh, because training is uh, another really long procedure to complete. So we want to make sure that our training procedure is more efficient. So we develop some new algorithms for training and uh, that's what we are doing right now. Yes. Uh -huh. You need the massive computational resources for uh, uh, putting that into practice, right? That's right, that's right. So uh, because my f research has been more on CPU side of computation, I didn't have a, like a good GPU card that time but uh, I didn't have a research because I just started, I couldn't get uh, some research funding to purchase a GPU. So I was looking for some uh, people who had GPUs and then uh, experts in AI already so that I can collaborate with them. And then uh, I found some people uh, in Korea. And actually I met them in Facebook. So I was talking about like a deep learning approach into the Facebook. And then there were some other people who were also interested in a similar field. And then uh, that's how we ended up like uh, some started some collaboration. Wow. I mean, one would expect that to happen on LinkedIn, but on Facebook is, a, is quite surprising, I must say. That's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Facebook was a uh, thing. Yeah, so I was like complaining about how deep learning method is about like uh, solving optimization. I mean, I mean, how can deep learning can solve some optimization problem? So I was complaining about it, but then that uh, some people corrected me and gave more ideas and shared more lights on that area. So I was able to learning from them. And then we started collaboration. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people uh, trying to combine, you know, optimization with machine learning. Mm -hmm. And I, I think not many people have been quite successful like you in doing that. Uh, what do you think it's, uh, you know, a promising avenue of research and maybe you could connect with the main research topic that you are working on nowadays mm -hmm. yes um well i mean i also just started so uh i don't know if i can i am successful but uh, i'm trying uh, here's the thing so deep learning approach especially like a, a deep reinforcement learning approach has been quite successful or they were successful in uh, drawing attention from people because uh, initially many people thought, including, including myself, it would be impossible to learn the solutions of TSP, but it was possible. So, uh, but now for more complicated problems like a big routing problem with some practical uh, constraints or time window constraint, a capacity constraints and so on, and it's quite hard. So deep learning alone, I don't think it can alone solve all the problems. So we still need optimization method, and uh, we are happy with that. So <laughs> as an optimization uh, expert, so uh, we need ex optimization 
uh, algorithms to solve the uh, those very complicated problem. But deep learning can be used to expedite some part of it. Uh, for my case, I was focusing on uh, cutting plane generation, like a cut separation problem. So when we solve uh, the big routing problem, exactly we have some like a branch and cut, branch and price and cut, and uh, cutting planes are playing some uh, some crucial roles in the success of those methods. And we still are very early stage in uh, for finding cuts, proper cuts, I believe. And then uh, because cut separation problem, as you know, is an NP hard problem itself, is very, very challenging. So we don't have many algorithms for that, but uh, neural network, I think, like a, a deep learning approach can give some more ideas. I mean, the ideas that we have never explored. So to test the idea, so I started to separate the, uh, the most fundamental uh, cuts in the uh, big routing problem, like uh, for rounded capacity inequalities. And so we developed some neural network based algorithm, not solely on neural network, but uh, some other like uh, procedures as well around it. That. And uh, we created some algorithm and then uh, we found that the existing heuristic algorithm are not good at solving, I mean, solving the separation problem for large scale. Because, you know, in uh, early 2000, uh, those cut separation algorithms, CBRPCEP has been uh, developed. And that time, the main challenge was about like a 100 nodes and 200 nodes at that scale. But we are talking about these days, like more than 500 nodes and thousands of nodes and so on. So uh, that algorithm is not suitable for solving this scale of the problem. So our algorithm based on neural network may not be the best algorithm, but we just able to find out the old algorithm does not serve this new scale problems. So that's an important uh, lesson. So maybe then after that, we can work on some other new optimization algorithms as well. Yeah, I can totally yes. relate to that work because I, I started using CVRP set myself back in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that at the time, uh, people were still trying to solve the instances with 150 customers and mm -hmm. then 200 mm -hmm. customers. And then when those instances were solved, uh, our group in Brazil proposed mm -hmm. the, the new set of benchmark instances uh, in, in a work led by Eduardo Shoa, and it's, it's, which is known as the X instances and uh, contains uh, test problems up to 1,000 customers. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's very uh, encouraging and interesting to learn that you guys have been making progress in separating uh, capacity cuts for, for, for those larger instances. And it seems that your the paper associated with that work was uh, just accepted in Informed Journal Computing, correct? Yes, correct. So uh, we are very excited about it. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the X instances are guiding us, guiding us uh, in that research. So I am thankful for, for you too. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to know that, that the, the new set of instances are helping the uh, research community to, to make substantial progress uh, in, in that sense. Um, Chang, uh, we have to talk about your involvement with Julia. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the programming language, uh, just to be yep. clear. <laughs> <laughs> Not woman. <laughs> uh, so when did your interest in Julia start? Yes, um, Julia, I mean, I love Julia. Uh, during my PhD work, I used a MATLAB for coding because that time, I mean, like a numerical efficiency was not the main concern. And as I mentioned, I was interested in like optimal control problem that involves like a differential education. And then MATLAB had a good differential education server. So I was using MATLAB. And after graduating, and I found that I, as a faculty member, need to purchase a MATLAB license, which is quite expensive. So, I mean, I had to purchase, but uh, I was looking for some alternative, like open source alternative. I was considering Python first. Python first, but uh, you know, the MATLAB has like a one based index and Python has zero based index. I was so familiar with the uh, one based index that time. So I didn't care about Python. No, no Python, no Python at all. Just because Python of also, that? Yes. Yes. Just because of that. That was the main reason, main reason. I mean, you know, <laughs> I know I was, I was but, and then uh, like 2000, 
12, 13, I heard about Julia. Julia at that time was very similar to MATLAB and uh, was based on one index. So the index starts at one. I mean, to me, like uh, the arrays representing vectors, so the first element must be one, index one. But, you know, but that time Julia was just starting, so didn't really have much for like optimization. It only had like uh, some simple numerical libraries for solving linear equations and so on, and uh, no support for optimization. I mean, I need to use Cplex and Groby, and uh, Julia had no connections to them. So I gave up. So I was using MATLAB with Payne and, uh, for a while. And I think uh, 2014, after a couple of years later, folks from PhD students at that time from MIT developed some uh, package called JUMP. It's a, a modeling language, optimization modeling language that connects the mathematical models with the uh, solvers like Cplex and Groby. So I was so excited about it. And then I started actually using them and I loved them. I really loved them. And uh, I always wanted to use some open source servers as well, like a CBC and CLP and IPOPT. And uh, because of my lack of knowledge that time about C programming language, I was not even able to compile them. This compilation is, uh, itself is, was difficult, challenging. And I started using Julia and the, the developers behind Julia made that possible. And that was super easy. You just install uh, Julia package, and Julia package installs those uh, related open source servers automatically. I was so happy about it. So I switched everything to Julia at that time. Uh, and yes. uh, after um, some time, you wrote this book, right? That's right. You have my first edition, the, the very early copy of my book. Yeah. I'm very glad. I'm very <laughs> glad. Yes. So, I mean, that book, uh, I mean, I didn't have any intention to write a book, actually. But uh, I just, uh, in 2014, before I moved to uh, Florida, I started writing some tutorial for my students. You know, Julia was so early that age. And uh, if I want my students to also use Julia, I had to teach them. And there's no resource on the internet at all. So I started to write down some tutorial for myself and my uh, students. But then after moving to Florida in, in Tampa, University of South Florida, I met a colleague that time there who self-published his book through Amazon. And um, at Amazon, uh, there was some support for like, if you upload PDF or uh, some other files, then uh, they just produce it and sell on it. I, was, I thought that was a great idea. And also my tutorial, has been bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I added some a few more chapters to make it a, as a book. And I typeset myself and I printed myself and I priced them myself and I sold them in through Amazon and other channels as well. So that's how I ended up. Uh -huh. And why is there a cat in the book cover? <laughs> no reason. No, there's absolutely no reason. So I thought uh, and Julia uh, is a feminine name, right? And uh, because my wife is an artist, so I asked her to design the cover. I mean, actually, the cover was designed by my wife. Wow. And then my wife said, said that there might be some, some cute animal. So uh, she introduced an, a cat image there and made a cover. Uh -huh. Yes. So that's random cat. And actually, I mean, that's the first edition. In the second edition, the first edition with the, like a, the Julia, the, uh, the, the letters are with flowers and so on. And uh, that's from just from, we purchased the font style from uh, somewhere else. But in the second edition, I asked my wife to actually work on the, uh, the Julia lettering. And this is the, her work, original work. And uh, this is became, uh, the cover, cover, and then I also asked my daughter to draw the cat. So if you go to my website, and uh, there is an original drawing of cat uh, from my daughter, and uh, that became family work. So <laughs> it's a family project, right? <laughs> yeah. So in the third edition, you're going to involve your son then. So the four I hope. of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Yes. There. Mm -hmm. uh, did that book change your life? It did. It did. Uh, I mean, first, I enjoyed my time. 
And uh, I enjoyed my time with Julia and I enjoyed my time with writing the book and then a whole production process of it and you know, everything. And also I became to know many people from open source because of that book. And I am not, I'm still I mean, making some connections with them and I'm part of the Jump Steering Committee, which is an open source uh, community that has become uh, bigger and bigger, bigger since then. And it's actually focused, I mean, sponsored by non-focus. I mean, non-focus is an organization that also uh, sponsors like uh, NumPy in Python and other many other like uh, scientific computing libraries. In there. And then uh, when I go to conferences and uh, I meet people from uh, IE and OR and they occasionally started mentioning about my book. So they were using my book in uh, their teaching and uh, they were using my pack, my Julia packages in their researches. And uh, so when I meet some strangers in random places, they sometimes talk about my book. And then that made my life, my conference life more enjoyable and with, I mean, positive surprises. So I love that experiences. So it changed my life. And then my interest in Julia made me uh, study deeper in computing. So I understand now how the computer works better and I understand now how we can make uh, uh, like a publishable packages with Julia and Python. And that even made me uh, learn like a C and C++ languages. Now I'm using those in my research as well. And like a, this whole experience with different computing languages and computational um, science and engineering aspects. And now I'm using all of those to tackle the problems in big routing problems and cut separation problems. Right. So, so that changed my life. So all the Julia experience also made you a better software engineer in, in a way. Yes. Yes. In a way. So, yeah. In a way. Yeah. So I, I just got back from the Brazilian OR conference uh, literally yesterday. And mm -hmm. uh, one very good friend of mine, Joaquin. Yes. Uh, he, he's the guy in Brazil uh, involved with Jump. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. he's one of the uh, core Jump developer. Yeah. Yes. Very nice guy. He works for PSR. Uh, he's also a great supporter of the Subjective Project. Uh, so, so I want uh, to to give some credit to him. I think he's uh, doing a lot for uh, the open source community and uh, especially Correct. the Julia community, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of contributions to the Jump in Julia. Yeah, he's very good. Plus, he's a super nice guy. Uh, so mm -hmm. why did you decide to move back to South Korea? All right. Um, <laughs> that's a long story. And uh, of course, I was born in Korea. I grew up in Korea. I spent like uh, 24 years in Korea. And then I went to the United States to study. That was 2003, like 20 years ago. So I just moved to Korea in this semester, like two months ago, three months ago now. And, you know, I was happy with my life in the States, in the United States, and nothing's wrong with that. But after spending 10 years, I started thinking about possibility of go going back to Korea. I don't know why, but I was started to think about something was missing. I mean, I love my research. I'm, I love my work environment there. I love the uh, full of uh, collaborators in the States and so on. But still, I saw something was missing. And I considered going back to Korea a couple of times, but my wife had also a job in the United States in the same city, and we just solved the two body problem, you know? And then uh, I didn't want to create another like craziness in my life. A new instance and, of the two body problem, if you will. R right, right, right. That's right. So, um, and also our children is, they are growing as like American. I mean, they're basically Korean and American at the same time, and more towards a little bit about like American. I mean, they were educated in American education system, and they have like a friends, and they live in America all the time. So I didn't want to make some another interruption with that. So I gave up, and then, like two years ago from now, we spent our sabbatical year at KAIST in Korea as a whole family. And I loved it. I really loved it. But still, we went back to 
the States and we stayed there uh, with intention to live our life in America. But suddenly it changed. Suddenly it changed with our with my conversation with my wife during the last winter, during the winter break. We are talking about the future. I mean, we have lived in the America for 20 years. And we know we are quite happy with that part. Still, something was missing, but it was fine. But after we are thinking about the future, do we want to spend like a 20, 30, or 40 more years in America? The answer was no. No. So I wanted to have some change. So after talking to my family, especially my wife, we decided to move back. I mean, I decided to move back. So uh, because of the, all the complicated situations, uh, my family is still in Florida temporarily. So we are trying to gradually moving back to Korea, maybe one by one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. So something was missing. I was, as an immigrant, as an immigrant, uh, I was thinking about like, I don't belong to any community. I mean, I have like, I belong to two communities, like uh, the Korean communities, like my family and my friends in Korea. And at the same time, my like professional friends and colleagues and other personal friends in the States too. So theoretically, I should belong to two different communities, but inside of me thinking about like, I belong to none of them. So that feeling was very sad, very, very sad, <laughs> you know? So uh, I don't know, so maybe some, any modern people, not just immigrants should have the same feeling, maybe similar feeling, but to me, the immigration itself was a big thing. So something has been changed in my inside of me. So I'm in Korea right now, which yeah. I'm enjoying. I'm very, very much enjoying, like a feeling home. So this feeling was something maybe I was hoping to have for a long time in the past, a couple of, uh, several years. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and what are your plans for the future? It's hard. It's hard. Um, I mean, when I started to study in America, I thought my future would be simple. Like after a PhD, I get a job. I didn't think about where at that time, but I ended up a job in the States. Still was my life was simple. And then uh, after having like a children and after the marriage, uh, life gets a little bit compli more complicated. And now I'm here. For the future, I hope to still live in Korea, and I hope to uh, finish retire here. Maybe I mean after retirement, I don't know where I will be living because most likely my children will be still living in the United States with their jobs and families. So maybe I want to go back to the states after the retirement, but uh, I don't know. No one knows. And in this process, process, uh, my wife has been really uh, supportive and uh, understand the concern. And actually, she has been an inspiration for me. I mean, her artwork, I mean, she's an artist. Her artwork is about like some aspect about like immigration as well, like a cultural diversity and uh, cultural displacement and belonging listeners about that. And uh, she has been working on uh, that area for a long time. And at first, at first, uh, I didn't understand. I didn't understand because uh, that was early on my immigration life, and I was happy with that. And I was I was just completely happy with my life in the states, but uh, I didn't understand. So I didn't understand her work. But later, after talking to her and after experiencing some different parts of the immigration life, I became to understand what she says through her artwork, and I really appreciate that. So now. Uh, she's an inspiration so i'm very thankful for her and her artwork so i'm happy yeah that's great uh, i can relate to uh, several things that you mentioned um, my parents are immigrants they came to brazil 50 years ago uh, they were after living in canada for seven years and uh, they are originally from india my brother's canadian <laughs> and although i was born in in brazil sometimes i feel like a tourist in my own hometown uh, and uh, you know, people struggle to pronounce my name. Some some of them assume that I'm an immigrant, even though I speak the language, and they uh, <laughs> have you know 
some uh, sometimes uh, trouble in understanding because I'm, I'm sort of an exotic figure around. There are hardly any Indian families. So the sense of belonging and, you know, finding your own identity, it can be tricky. And, and when I leave Brazil, uh, I no longer I'm no longer seen as a, as a Brazilian. Of course, when I'm here, I'm not also seen as a Brazilian, but, you know, but at least I speak Portuguese. And uh, so so it's it, it's quite uh, a thing. So I, I think I understand when you, when you say, okay, I, I'm an immigrant, and I'm, I know I'm, I think I belong to two different communities, to two communities in your case. And, and even you, you can extend that to OR because I was originally from industrial engineering, then I went to you know, do PhD in computing. I started working in an industrial engineering department, then I switched to a computer systems department. So uh, I think that's been my, my life, I would say, uh, to, to be with different communities, to uh, experience different cultures, languages. Uh, so, but I think that makes us grow and develop, and I think that makes us who we are. And in your case, probably all those challenges, two body problems, two different countries, uh, languages, mm -hmm. also um, enable you to be a top researcher and professional. So, so that's my view on right. this. Thank you. So, uh, you know, am I? feeling lily home completely in Korea right now? No, no. I mean, the answer to that question is also no, because, you know, I spent like 20 years in the States. I mean, there was a, has been a, a couple of okay, interesting incidents in Korea. So so when I pe when I meet my friends in the States, I am so accustomed to like a hug them, you know, uh -huh. so uh, a woman or uh, a man, regardless, I just hug them. So I so accustomed to that. And then after that, I came back to Korea, and then uh, there's no hugging culture in Korea. <laughs> so, so whenever I try to like uh, greet them by hugging, so there's some awkward moment, and then uh, started like uh, like uh, spreading my arms and approaching uh, them, and their reaction is a little bit awkward. So then it's too late to stop, you know. <laughs> so I still hug them, but that's, uh, the response was really strange. So you know, so there's uh, still I'm mean, experiencing a uh, cultural difference here. Yeah, you know, I spent like 20 years in the states, so different. Yeah, you have to tune your uh, uh, algorithm when <laughs> interacting with people. Yeah, you know, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So when you meet yeah. Indian people, we have to do this. When you meet you uh -huh. know, Brazilians, they hug, they kiss, and, uh -huh. and even Italians. Uh, but then you, when you meet other like folks from Asia, you should sort of keep a distance. So it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Uh, we have to yes. uh, get used to that. Uh, and and uh, Chang, I really hope to meet you soon. Uh, and give you a hug. <laughs> yeah. So, <Give> a hug. <laughs> so you're you're most welcome to 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 visit us, uh, and uh, I mean in Brazil. And uh, I'll be happy to introduce you to some uh, of the folks that are working with Julia. Uh, we okay. ourselves uh, t uh, teach uh, or uh, using Julia at times. Mm -hmm. So nice. anyway, this conversation was great. It was fantastic to learn about your life. And when I bought this book of yours uh, a couple of years ago, I never expected to have this conversation with you. And I might say that when you followed me on Twitter, uh, when I was, you know, starting this project, my, I told my wife and she was super excited and she said, oh, she put a lot of exclamation marks uh, because I, I think I, I texted her and mm -hmm. uh, she was, uh, you know, you were, you were a book author. So that makes things a bit more <laughs> fancy, if you will. So, so it has been a I great. I also experience. want to meet her, meet her and you, and to talk about the uh, Japanese manga. Oh also. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you guys have a lot to talk. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Chang, uh, it was fantastic. Really, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me here again. Yeah. So looking forward to meeting you uh, in the near future. Take care. I do. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. Bye.